Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming here for our final book talk. I'm Blair Thomas, the director of the Puppet Festival, and really glad to be here um, for this. Uh, it's our penultimate day. Uh, uh, a whole evening of lots of performances tonight in the city, and then tomorrow more performances, uh, closing out with Yael Razuli doing her Edith Piaf cabaret performance at six. Super fun and exciting. But before that, we have here uh, two guests and uh, Paulette Richards, who is uh, my co-conspirator on putting together the symposium, as uh, will now take over. So go ahead, Paulette. Thank you. Thank all of the intrepid people who came out at this hour of the day when we're kind of a little, um, a little tired from all of the <laughs> exciting things that have been happening here at the festival. It's a lot of puppets. It's my great pleasure to introduce the editors of this wonderful volume, Puppet and Spirit, Ritual, Religion, and Performing Objects, another wonderful puppet book from Rutledge. And also, this is just volume one. So all the work that went into this, there's still more work going on. And there will be another volume when? Uh, hopefully by uh, the end of the year, okay. <laughs> which uh, Paulette close. actually has a chapter in, a wonderful chapter about Voudon uh, mm -hmm. that I'm really excited to have in the mm -hmm. book. Yes, so since you're sitting next to me, yes. I will introduce you first. This is Tim Cusack. Uh, Cusack. Cusack, thank you. You're An adjunct lecturer in theater at Hunter College. He was the co-founder and artistic director of Theater Askew, an independent theater company dedicated to the exploration of representations of queerness on stage. Puppetry has always been an aspect of his creative process, and I also want to um, signal that Tim is an extremely gifted and dedicated <laughs> copy editor, <laughs> and he is responsible for making sure that the reviews that are now in the festival archive are up to snuff. <laughs> and then on the end, of course, is Claudia Orenstein, professor of theater at Hunter College and the Graduate Center at CUNY, CUNY. She has spent over a decade writing on contemporary and traditional puppetry in the US and Asia. She was very modest in her bio blurb for the book mm -hmm. and her um, CV goes on and on, mm -hmm. but she has many important puppet publications to her credit. And so um, without further ado, because this text is so rich, mm. we're going to uh, dive in. Did you want to start with your PowerPoint? Or uh, with the questions? Yeah, well, actually, I wanted to start with a, a little statement. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I follow this writer on Medium, David Price. And if you guys don't know him, I really recommend him. He's really fantastic. And he's very, very disciplined about his writing. Every morning, he comes out with a new thing. And I kind of, dare I say, religiously read him every day. It's <laughs> like that's how I start my day. And I kind of had a feeling that my, my boy Dave was going to give me something fabulous today. And boy, did he ever. And I wanted to just read you... The, the first two paragraphs of what he wrote today, because I really feel like it gets to the heart of what this book is about, and I felt like this would be a really beautiful way to sort of set the vibrational field for this experience that we're all about to have together. We're told that matter doesn't actually exist, except in a very transitory and illusory way. Evidently, there's a grand and intelligent energy that shapeshifts into infinite different forms, creating universes and all its denizens. <laughs> Point taken, right? <laughs> there it is, right there. Our physical world, which looks so literal and obvious, isn't. Nothing is as it seems. Everything is expressing or wants to express something that has implications of the infinite, of the divine. Our mythology has demoted matter to the profane realm, which allows us to imagine it's available as dead clay for us to use any way we wish. That belief system trains us to destroy the world by refusing to admit it's a manifestation of the divine. 
A whole civilization built on such a mindset is now reaching its logical conclusion to the shock and horror of millions. And I know for myself personally, uh, why I wanted to work on this book is to fight against that. Fight against that way of looking at matter, that way of looking at how we as human beings, as I feel embodied divine beings, deal with our material world. So I just wanted to like, I felt like that really kind of said what Very I wanted to yeah. say. Yes. So yeah. Claudia, what, what do you? I might have more modest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're talking about um, uh, interest in working on the book. Um, uh, my uh, way I came to this book is really because I was uh, pursuing my own research in uh, puppetry and suddenly kind of reflected on the fact that the puppetry that was so exciting to me um, were these forms that were connected with uh, ritual, that there was some other dimension and some other kind of... Um, uh, maybe vibration, to use your word, yeah. uh, coming out of them. And um, uh, I wanted to um, think about that. And I found if when I was giving talks, like in places like this, you know, to puppeteers about uh, these um, puppet traditions, that people were really kind of excited and they wanted to know more. And um, that that was a topic, and it's not as though, I mean, at puppetry, we were always talking about, you know, the puppet and spirit, and um, it's, these traditions are known, but um, I didn't feel like there had been really a, like, let's, like, I, I came to the idea of, like, a ritual puppet, like, that that's a thing, a ritual puppet, and that, wow, <laughs> we need to talk about the fact that there is the ritual puppet and what that means, and... Yeah, and, and that the ritual puppet, um, can be very entertaining, but that it also serves all these other myriad functions um, to exercise a, a space that's been contaminated with evil spirits, to, to celebrate the birth of a new child, to launch a new business, to heal a sick child. I mean, we, throughout the book, um, and, and this is across the board, no matter where these puppets are manifesting, they serve these incredibly powerful functions that really go to the heart of our human needs for shelter, for safety, for health, for community, for, uh, for peace of mind, to ease our passage into whatever comes after this reality that we all think is reality. Great, thank you. So the, um, now we had uh, talked through a set of questions that we were mm -hmm. intending to get to, uh, but I think maybe we should start with the Declaration of Positionality, ah. which has become important, I think, in theater and um, also in critical work, because, uh, of course, the notion of objectivity is a convention. And so where are we coming from vis-a-vis -vis spirituality? Mm. And mm -hmm. how does that inform our experience of puppet and spirit? So I'll start, and then we'll go down yeah, the line. Great. Yeah, so I was confirmed in the Presbyterian Church I was educated primarily in Catholic schools. I taught in Jesuit institutions for 13 years, um, and I consider myself to be an animist. Well, I was raised Irish Catholic in Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and if you've ever been to Scranton, Joe Biden's hometown, uh, it is white ethnic Catholic. And if you're Catholic, if you're Irish, you don't go to the Italian church. If you're Polish, you don't go to the Lithuanian church, right? So it's very specific form of Catholic, working class white Catholicism. Um, and it's interesting because in Claudia's first book, uh, first collection, Rutledge Companion, which I was the assistant editor on, there's an essay in that book that talks about the use of the crucifix in the Good Friday services. And, and I still to this day think about that chapter, even though this is like 10 years ago we worked on that book, because when I was a kid in church on the Good Friday services, when, and if you, if you aren't Catholic, what, what happens in that, on that at the day is that the priest, they basically do the Stations of the Cross, and they, they carry the crucifix around the church to all of the, the images of the stages of Jesus' crucifixion, right? And I remember as a kid having this incredibly profound experience of almost this multidimensional portal that would open up for me on that day, where that cross really became Jesus for me, almost like this living entity. And, and so 
when I was working on Claudia's first book, that chapter just really kind of drew me in. And I think in some ways kind of was the hook that pulled me into this book, right? Um, in terms of where my spirituality is now, I left Catholicism 30 years ago. Um, I'm now more of a New Age person. I'm actually a tarot card reader, and if anybody wants a reading after them, I, we can go <laughs> do a reading. Um, and so I've kind of really gotten more into New Age mysticism and sort of this idea of the quantum field, and I talk, we talk about that in the introduction to the book, and that you know all of this reality we are constructing and creating in the moment in our consciousness. And I think what's beautiful about puppetry is that there's a way in which the creation of the puppet is a manifestation of the re bigger reality that we're manifesting all the time. The puppet, we just can see it more clearly. Well, let's see. My uh, background, I guess, is ethnically Jewish. Um, I was not raised observant, except maybe to like have a Passover meal or a Hanukkah. Um, like, what do they call us? Um, twice a year Jews, once a year Christians, or something like <laughs> we celebrate, you know, well, East, uh, um, Christmas and <laughs> Hanukkah and. Um, my, uh, my father uh, grew up uh, in France during the war and had to uh, live, um, it was sent to live with a Christian family to pretend he was not uh, Jewish mm -hmm. in order to um, survive the war and we have family members who did not um, survive that. And um, he really, you know, didn't feel and probably still doesn't feel that like, you know, it was unsafe to say what your religion is and to um, express that. Um, and my um, mother was all into surrealism and wrote about surrealism. So I think that was that's kind of her, uh, been her, you know, ritual religious uh, connection, and um, was very involved in the uh, women's movement um, and uh, writing about uh, goddess artists, artists who sort of started, you know, articulating the idea of a goddess rather than God as a kind of means of empowerment. And so I guess if I had any relationship to anything spiritual or ritual, you know, kind of in my early childhood, those are sort of the <laughs> the, the points. Um, so so I didn't have this uh, kind of like religious upbringing. And um, I guess if I, I, for today, I think if I feel anything, you know, the, the religious world that I, I think I, or traditional, I would say, um, established kind of religious ideas I gravitate towards are probably more Buddhist. You know, wisdom and compassion is something I think that, you know, we could all uh, learn from. Um, and uh, uh, maybe my religion was the theater, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a kind of ritual aspect and, you know, kind of passion uh, there. And, um, uh, and you know, these uh, the, uh, puppetry forms that are, um, you know, connected to ritual, something about them really draws me to them. And uh, I spent, um, you know, it, I spent a lot of time taking students to India to do, um, uh, study abroad and then did research on Indian puppetry and um, I have been to a lot of temple rituals in my life for someone who didn't grow up with any kind of observance. I've been to a lot of uh, Buddhist and Hindu and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, rituals and um, I don't know, it's, so I, I guess they, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly like to say if they speak to me or I'm rejecting that, you know, it's more like uh, this book and these kind of works give me a chance to think about that and reflect on it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, growing up Catholic, um, and, and, and our second book, Frank Mulgary, who's, I think you guys, many of you know, is a you know, Chicago puppeteer. Um, Frank has a chapter in our second book about growing up working class Italian here in Chicago. And, and that chapter for me really resonates because I absolutely relate to all of the stuff. Like growing up Catholic, having objects be an expression of spirituality is that just part of it, right? You don't even think twice about it. And it was funny, I, I was coming here on the airplane last night from New York, and I was sitting next to this kind of big, burly, bald, white guy, kind of really big guy. And at one point, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him go like this. And I was like, and of course it caught my eye. And I realized that he was saying the rosary. And you know, for those of you who grew up Catholic, you know, the rosary is this prayer to the Virgin Mary. And it's like there's certain beads. And you, you, there's, you say the Hail Mary in each bead. And it represents this journey. And it just really struck me that here's this guy in the plane like expressing spirituality in this very material way and then we also have a chapter in the book uh, Salma Masani and we'll get to Salma in a moment but she talks about the use of the rosary in Islamic traditions and that it probably came from Buddhism so that like these threads that kind of go through all of these different spiritual traditions and yet somehow there are these echoes that 
that reverberate amongst all of them. Okay, thank you. So now we've established where we're coming from. Yeah. And you said the M word, materiality. Yeah. And so I'm gonna skip ahead to um, this question. The theme of this year's Ellen Van Volkenberg Symposium series is the materiality of the puppet. And yet, we are closing with a discussion of material performance and bodiless presence. Mm. Please give some examples from the book of performance in which the puppet becomes a nexus where the material and spiritual realities, realms meet. And so I would just like to kind of just start by saying it's pretty much all the examples yeah. from the book. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things we talk about in the introduction is you actually get this triangular kind of relationship because there's some kind of spirit, there's some kind of object, and there's some kind of human. Yeah. Um, and that I, uh, we felt that that was like, uh, so the, the, the human and the object is something that we talk about a lot in puppetry, but this kind of more triangular, like how do you think about what those ontologies are and how they relate to each other and... Mm -hmm. uh, that they're all affecting each other, mm -hmm. this connection. Yeah, I mean, because I'm a big New Age guy, so sacred geometry is really big in the New Age world. And I actually was funny because I was rereading the, the introduction on my way here, and I, that, that caught my eye that I remembered that. I was like, oh, right. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think it's like, again, this idea of a portal. It's like somehow this portal gets opened up when these three consciousnesses all interact, and there's something I'm kind of getting more and more interested in this idea. Like, I, again, as a kid, like, I felt like in church on Good Friday, like, I felt... Like I was in this other world, and it's kind of hard to describe it. But you, you know what I, you know what I mean, right? And you know, sometimes I mean, there, there are different ways that sometimes uh, in some of the traditions we look at, like the uh, object, the puppet, is thought of as, um, or rather, I would say, it, you know, in in the um, uh, in some of these established views, there are some uh, places where objects are thought of as having spirit and others as places where spirits alight, you know, that they become a conduit. So those are two slightly different ways of thinking about uh, animism and the animated material. Yes, and in the hula ki'i tradition, which is Hawaiian tradition, and again, I was reminded of this yesterday, the, the, the puppeteer, as the puppeteer is making the puppet, they are transmitting their own uh, mana, which is the Polynesian term for spirit, into the puppet. So there's even that idea, right? So the so I'm going to actually put my life force into that object as well. But let's go back to materiality um, because I think for me what's more interesting question is that in so many of these traditions what you make the puppet out of or in, in they're not all puppets the object really matters. Um, so for example, we have a we have a and how you make the puppet matters. So, for example, uh, we have a chapter on the Torah as, as a performing object in Jewish ritual. And, like, that, that, that's got to be kosher. It's got to be the, 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 the material that's made from has got to be treated through, through all of the kosher rules. Um, the, when the, uh, the Torah scribe is, is and it's all done by hand, and it can't make a mistake. And if you make a mistake, you have to go back and start all over again. Um, and then even in, like I, was, I mentioned hula ki'i, the wood that the puppet is made out of, these are very specific types of wood, and those are the only types of wood that the puppet can be made out of. And I know you, you also talk about that yeah. in, in your So in your I have a chapter um, in the book called The Matter That Matters, and it's about the Nangyai Thai tradition, but it's also kind of an investigation that there are traditions, lots of puppets, but what makes one puppet speci special or a ritual puppet or somehow more embodied with spirit? Like what, what's required? Is it the kind of material that's used? Is it something that you say over the puppet? Is it something about the way the, uh, the puppeteer is anointed? You know, so there are even, um, there's an example we give also of, um, from Matthew Cohen, who talks about how uh, Indonesian puppeteers, um, that there are some puppets that are really powerful, you know, even in a particular collection. So even where there are puppets that are being used for ritual, then there are some sort of very specific material characters, either as a tradition or either just a particular puppet you have to happen to have that seems to have these other powers or to be more, um, uh, 
you know, so you uh, have some, uh, something extra with more charge. Yes, yeah, right. And and don't you also uh, mention Claudia in your book on on the tie form that um, the the animal that is that made the leather is made out of has to have died, like it has to be hit by lightning, and it can't be actually slaughtered. Is yeah. That so well, there are all these. You know, I was trying to find out what the actual what 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 the, the rules are. I, I started. I mean, I don't want to jump into some of the the text, but um, I had a very wonderful um, s uh, master's student, um, Patara um, uh, Danutra, who uh, years ago wrote a wonderful master's thesis on the Tai Nang Yai, and it was all about um, the role of Buddhist uh, priests in preserving um, this uh, tradition, even though um, they're telling kind of Hindu stories. And um, and the, one of the reasons was because the Buddhist priests are so powerful that they can somehow manage the power of these um, uh, of these puppets. At least that was the, the story that was being told. And so they were they were being preserved at the at the monasteries or at the temples. Um, and so I was like, well, what makes them so powerful, <laughs> you know? And wanted to know. And yes, yeah, so there are, you know, and there are, there's sometimes. And I think actually this gets to I think a bigger question about the book, which is the interest an openness or reluctance to talk about this kind of thing, like yeah. something that's spiritual or something that uh, is about the unseen or is about a very particular mystical or religious view. Um, and so uh, did I always get the same answer from everybody? No, did I get, you know, how clear was the were the answers about whether that's still, um, it's still the case, so that this is the idea that the puppet uh, has to be made out of leather from a cow that has died in a way that is uh, unusual, like being hit by lightning or, um, you know, died uh, with a stillbirth or something, but wasn't, ki you're not slaughtering the cow somehow to get this leather for the puppet. Um, yeah, it's almost as if certain materials are better at containing and channeling the energies than others, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, and probably what <clears throat> I skipped over that I shouldn't have was what definition of spirit are you working oh. with? What energies are we talking about? Oh, <laughs> oh boy, that was, that was a tough nut to crack. Um, uh, well, it's, a, it's complicated, and I, I think it's really hard. I, you know, I think any t the minute you actually try to um, freeze it into a linguistic form, mm -hmm. it immediately flies away, right? Um, but the, the, the approach that we took was to try to ground it in some academic discourse, right? Because it's like, well, we're, you know, what is it? And you know, I personally, and this is again because of my my sort of new age bias. To me, it's consciousness, right? And that if if you really, we brought in stuff about the quantum field, and if you kind of really really look at quantum theory, you know, we none, none of us we're all kind of all just electrons, just like buzzing around each other, right? Like none of us are really here, right? Like Claudia and I are just like. <laughs> Inter, like we're not actually here, right? <laughs> so if you really kind of follow that logic, then there's really no division between me and my book, right? <laughs> or me and my phone. Mm -hmm. well, or that's me, true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> or me and this water bottle, right? So then if I'm using these objects to like have a little conversation with each other, right? Then like it, it, it that's spirit. Like spirit is just everywhere. It's, it's within everything. I'm going to say that, you know, the book is also, and I think the writings are also an investigation of that question. Yeah. Um, uh, the, there's an article, it's, a, it's an interview with the Hako Mawashi, these wonderful puppeteers uh, in Japan, and I've written on them elsewhere, and here we have an interview with, um, uh, that Tomoe Kobayashi and Simon Murs uh, did with um, uh, Nakauchi and uh, Minami, who are these puppeteers who go house to house over New Year's and visit a thousand homes, blessing homes with their puppets. They're about the most wonderful uh, people I've ever met. And um, I have been asking, like, trying to, when I was writing about them myself, trying to get this, answer this question, like, so when you take this puppet, they have a puppet that gives blessings, you know, do you feel like a spirit or an energy going through you? Or, like, I wanted to know, like, what does it mean to be this kind of, you know, powerful person? Because they go to all these houses, and sometimes people will tell them about their, you know, health issues, and they're there to give the blessings. 
Um, and she was like, oh no, you know, like I just, you know, want to bring joy. <laughs> yeah. my, my job is to, uh, you know, bring good spirit. And, uh, you know, sometimes I come back and people say, oh, then my health thing can't, you know, because you came, it fixed it. But she says, I, it's not that I feel anything special. I just, you know, I really want to kind of be there for them and um, uh, bring this joyfulness for the new year. And, um, listen to them, and it's almost a kind of social work that they do, uh, especially in these mountain areas where there's a lot of um, elderly people now who live there, and a lot of the young people have left, and maybe they're living alone. And so once a year, they're coming by, you know, and um, doing this. But they do it with the puppet, and the puppet. Uh, we will get to, to photos later. Actually, I have a bag here. You'll see. Uh, it doesn't have Ebisu on it, does it? Maybe not. Uh, the Ebisu puppet that brings the blessings. It's about the most joy pu joyous puppet face you've ever seen. Like, and to have a puppet, you know, pat you on the head and say good blessings to you. There's something they go around to everybody in the house. So, I don't know what is the spirit in that. Is there a real spirit of the god Ebisu who's there? Is it something just about the joyfulness of that moment? Um, I mean, I think it's an invest for me. It's an investigation. I don't don't have an answer to it. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes I do know things where like everything I need to be doing falls into place and you feel like something is right. And so there's got to be yeah. something going on because it's not just me, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't have a clear view of what that is. And I think that this, the, the, the title of Puppet in Spirit for me is more an invitation for yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, one of the, we, we, we're, we deal with a, a there's a, a sociologist whose name I'm not going to remember at the moment, but he kind of created this definition of spirituality versus religion. And and the first in that definition, the first thing he talks about is that it's it, spirituality is very individual, right? That that that's the that's the biggest difference between the idea of spirituality versus established religion, that you're figuring it out for yourself. Each one of us in this room is figuring out our relationship to what these things mean on our own, right? And your answer is not going to be her answer, it's not going to be his answer, it's not going to be your answer, right? And that's the beauty of it. And I think there's a real direct correlation to the work of the artist and the puppeteer, which is that, you know, you are manifesting these bigger themes that we've all dealt with as humans, but the way you're going to manifest it is not the way you're going to manifest it, it's not the way he's going to manifest it, it's the way she's going to manifest yeah. it. And that's the beauty of being human. Yeah. Um, and just okay. to tag on to think about yeah, Hakamashi uh, for one second. So uh, 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 that's beautiful. I love, and I, those women are so amazing. Um, but as opposed to someone like Yaya, Yaya Kulabali, who's a Malian, Malian puppeteer, and for him, it's about this, this obligation to continue the, the spirit of his people, mm -hmm. that, that he must continue with the Shogobo because that is what's maintaining the, the, the ancestral energy of his entire, not just village, but all of his people. And so it's a sort of different sense of responsibility mm -hmm. and what spirit means in that respect. Um, I was just also going to add in that um, I think it was also a surprise for us when we put out the call for papers and we kind of give this offering and actually that that quote of the disembodied uh, I can't remember what the that was the insult in yeah that, that was a the sort of from the earlier title that we had um, got you know it didn't end up using but um, I think we were surprised with what people came back to us like people were responding you know to the words. Uh, in their own ways, and especially, w you know, the reason there are two volumes is because we got so many responses, and I think, you know, I was probably thinking of traditional forms, which is really um, mostly what's in the first volume, and then we had artists and um, uh, scholars uh, and all kinds of people respond saying, I want to be talking about this, and uh, can I, and, you know, with things that weren't necessarily, at least what I had originally thought, um, and as we're working on the, the second book, there are, we won't necessarily have to talk about that today, but there are things that are very confessional, sometimes yeah. by professors, you know, yeah. who want a kind of path for discussing something that is whatever this evanescent thing is that we're all trying to talk, yeah. talk about or right. characterize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, so I see, and you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to start with that quote from David Price is because I do actually, even though this is an academic book and there's all the reasons why you need to do it when you're in academia, I mean, to me, this is also a spiritual offering mm -hmm. to okay. the world and to the community. And, and it's, an opera, it's a place in which people are, are given permission to talk about some things that maybe in our rationalistic, Western, materialistic, capitalistic world 
is suspect, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that making a space for these kinds of conversations is actually really a, a spiritual mm -hmm. effort. Yeah, so we had talked about um, how approaching it as an academic subject makes it a thing. A thing, right. So we're, it. We're back. <laughs> now it's a thing. So you call now it like a, a ritual puppet. Like now, <laughs> now that's a term you can yeah. always. But, but also um, we talked about the labor that goes into producing this work um, and not just the labor of the puppeteers who are going around dispensing these blessings with their puppets, but also the labor that you all put yeah. into this book. Yeah. And you just answered that question. Um, by saying that you see your work as an offering, and I was going to talk about how is this a devotion to you? So see, we're in the Catholic yeah, realm here. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I actually wanted yeah. to say something about that because you know, actually working on this book, like I had my own sort of shape and view of what I thought would be interesting to look at, and sometimes things came back to us. Like when I when you wrote those questions, and you wrote the word devotion. I, I had to sort of stop, and and I think this is part of the work of the book too, which is I had to stop and like I have a sort of a uh, very like step back reaction to the word devotion. You know, this is yeah. not a word in my growing up vocabulary yeah. to being devoted, uh, to devote, uh, although I devoted myself to the world of puppetry, you know, yeah. um, but in, a, in that religious sense, and I had to sort of stop and, and the way you characterize it as, you know, doing a kind of work for, for something that, you know, is, is a kind of offer, I would have said offering, and, and so it allows me to now, um, like absorb that word and accept yeah. that word. Like, yeah, that's a great like devotion. Yeah. Thank you. So I've expanded um, my uh, connection to other maybe uh, I don't even know if you want to say if spiritual, if not religious, ways of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And I think if we talk about like a devotional or some kind of uh, positive labor of the book, that sense of creating conversations and understanding across cultures and across. Uh, spiritual models and religions um, I think is certainly one of the interests of the book and I feel it working when I as I work on the book because there are other few things that I kind of had to I step back from and then I sort of had to think it's actually the same thing as you know some mm -hmm. of these other traditions I look at so it forced me to you know confront those things yeah. in yourself. Okay. Good. So um, I want to make sure that audience has an opportunity to join yes. in the questions, and you all brought these beautiful pictures. Yeah. Yeah. And at the festival here, we always want to see them. Yeah, we want to see them. So let's get into your slide pictures presentation. Pictures worth a thousand words. Yes. Um, so, um, so this is um, this is a priest of Shango. Uh, so this is a Brazilian form called Momolengo. Now, Isabella Prachado was the scholar who wrote the chapter on this book. And this is a, a puppet booth, hand puppet tradition, very much like a lot of the, 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 the puppet booth traditions. There's the puppeteer, there's the intermediary between the puppet booth and the audience, and there are musicians, right? So it's kind of that tripartite structure that you see in a lot of forms around the world. Um, and, um, you know, this is a, uh, it's a, um, it's, it's a syncretic religion like, like Vudon. So it's, it's, it's bringing together the old African Yoruban gods, Catholic gods, and in Brazil, specifically a lot of some indigenous deities from the indigenous people from South America. Um, and, um, you know, he is the Orisha of thunder, lightning, but also justice and, and law. And, um, and there's very much a racial component to this, as, you know, obviously this is an African puppet. Um, and oftentimes in these shows, the puppet is interacting with the white colonial rulers, particularly the women, the wives and the daughters, and uh, possessing them and making them, you know, do all sorts of things that proper white ladies of mm -hmm. Portuguese descent should not be doing. And I want to, as before we go on to the next photo, I just want to take a moment because we really do, there are, we have 17 um, uh, articles in this book. Uh, and some of them are interviews or co-authors, so that's a like 20 people plus a one really beautiful preface, I mean a foreword from uh, Jane Marie Law. So we really want to honor and uh, shout out to all these this, these huge, it's like a, a, a just a huge troop of yeah. congregation, thank you, of collaborators <laughs> who have put their work into this and um, they should all be honored here, even though we're talking to us. <laughs> Uh, so this is Lona E. Kanani. Uh, he is the Hawaiian or Polynesian Riddler god, so he's a trickster god. Um, 
And um, so this is the Hula Ki. Uh, this is Ali E. Mitchell, who uh, uh, is the pu he wrote he wrote he is an interview with Ali. E. He also created this is a puppet that he created. I love the eyes on this guy. Isn't that so cool? Right, his eyes are amazing, uh, so intense. Um, and the hula ki'i is actually a seated form of the hula. So it's a hula, it's, it's, it's just like hula, um, except the puppeteer, so the way it kind of works is, um, I'll just get up here. So like the, he's, the puppeteer's kind of seated on the ground and they've got the puppet on the lap and they're like doing this thing where like, I don't think I can do it. Like they're kind of getting up and going down like this. Like I, I can't even imagine how they do it. Um, but, uh, and then the, um, the, they're, they're, they're speaking the text. They're telling stories from Hawaiian legends. They're speaking the text in this very secret form of Hawaiian that's highly coded. It's a lot of puns. It's a lot of secret messages. Um, and that's, um, uh, that's, that's the, the hula ki'i, mm -hmm. dance of the sacred image. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, this, this is mine. you. So um, this is one of the uh, um, articles by uh, Bill Condi and Yasuko Senda is about um, karakuri ningyo, which are puppets that are um, part of these, th they're usually on these big um, dashi or floats that are pulled through the streets um, at these festivals. Talk and then the, about um, labor. Yes, and the, um, the puppets also do transformations that are sort of encoded in different stories. Um, there are a lot of uh, different traditions of this in Japan. And um, yes, actually, the, um, uh, Yasuko and uh, Bill Condi in this article, they talk a lot about that the labor itself of you know, pulling, the, the, needs the community to pull these carts through the streets. And that, that is actually thought of as you know, you're giving um, a devotion, devotion to the yeah, God yeah, through yeah. the community, yeah. creating this labor yeah. of the festival, yeah. as well as the interest of the puppets that are there. And this is uh, Shin Shinto, uh, specifically. Um, the other thing, too, not only is it people pulling the float, but there are teams of puppeteers inside of the float who have, and then musicians also, so there's all these different teams that are all working simultaneously to make this happen, and the coordination that's required among these teams of puppeteers to make these very elaborate effects. So for example, here, you, you can kind of see the girls on his shoulder, but they're doing, the girls are doing all this trapeze, and then at a certain point they land on his shoulder, and then he kind of reacts to it. So it's very, very elaborate. Mm -hmm. Great. So you guys get three more minutes to show pictures. OK. And you, so OK, you keep do, us on time. What we're going to do is whet people's interest so they want to buy the book Got it. find out <laughs> Got more. it, got it. <laughs> OK. Uh, this is uh, Narasimha. Narasimha is an avatar of Vishnu. If you know anything about Vishnu, Vishnu are all these different avatars. He's half lion, half uh, human. Uh, this is the Buana full body mass tradition from Majuli Island in the northeast of India. These are monasteries of devotees that kind of devote their whole lives to creating these very elaborate stories uh, of the life of Vishnu and all his different avatars. And this article is by our colleague at Hunter, Deepsika the Chatterjee. Deepsika Chatterjee. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, from my, my the article that I told you about. So this is the Nangyai, the Thai uh, puppetry, and the article is again about um, inquiries into you know how does uh, one kind of puppet become more in charge than another kind of puppet. Yeah. And these are the wonderful Hakamawashi puppeteers that I talked about, going house to house. Um, and here's Nakauchi-san, and um, she's carrying Ebi. So she has four different puppets that she brings, carries them in a box. Well, in the mountains, she's just on a backpack. But you know, the, what, uh, traditionally, in these boxes over their shoulders. And um, uh, at the end of um, the ceremony, the first three uh, puppets sort of take out all the impurities from the last year. And then Ebisu brings in all the good spirits for the good for the year to come. And he goes around to every single person in the house. And you put out your hands, and he puts his um, uh, his hand in yours and he says, ipa, ipa, which means like filling up your hands with good, you know, good <laughs> blessings. <laughs> and these are the Tolpava Kutu performers in um, Kerala, India, um, who do a uh, puppet shadow puppet show for the goddess Bhadrakali. Um, and uh, in this um, book, we, it's an interview with Ramachandra Pulavar, who's uh, the uh, older master puppeteer um, from Rahul Kunutara and Sangeet Sakar. And um, Rahul is actually his son, so, yeah. um, and now studying at UConn. And so uh, it was nice. I had written also about these puppeteers, but it was like, you can ask your dad all kinds of questions I can't ask. <laughs> like, uh, what, what, what else can we find out? And it's a really beautiful uh, piece. Yeah, and just the screen is supposed to represent the the, claw, the clothes of the goddess. Just so the whole thing is sacred. 
Uh, this is a Tazia procession from, if you guys know Tazia, it's a traditional Iranian performance form. It commemorates the Battle of Karbala when Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, was killed by his son. Um, I, I, this is a full body puppet. I just, you got to ad admire the commitment of this dude that he's like walking down the street <laughs> on his hands and knees. Talk about devotion. And of course, if you're Catholic, a lot of traditions have that thing where you crawl on your knees to something, right? So that kind of made me think of that yeah. through line of all these faith and traditions. And this is Sama Mohinsi. Sama Mohinsi. Yeah. Okay. So we'll look at this one and then we'll open okay, the floor. Okay, good. Got mm -hmm. it. Uh, uh, this is Samar. He's a clown, Sufi saint, clown uh, god. Um, so interesting, Kathy, the great Kathy Foley, I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, wrote this beautiful chapter about how these Sufi Islamic saints have somehow found their way into this Hindu, these Hindu stories. Um, and what I love about this dude is that like he's totally holy, but like he's flatulent and he drinks too much and he has too much sex and he does drugs and like he uses bad language and he's like he's like but he's like so badass that he's actually good. <laughs> Great, thank you. So um, Blair has picked up the roving mic, yes? Ooh, the roving, roving mic. mic. <laughs> We're all like, mic. There's, a, there's a powerful <laughs> object. So if, if you have a question, please raise your hand and he will bring the microphone to you so that we can hear it and the people in the live stream can hear it as well. Um, and as you're doing that, I, I might just say that, you know, we have different sections in the book that focus on different things. So it's not just like an iteration of here's all these different traditions. I mean, each of the articles takes a particular approach to questions and ways of thinking about um, this, these uh, topics. And uh, one is more about shama shamanic uh, tradition. Something is, one is, section is about community. Uh, one is more about uh, storytelling. And so they have different kind of themes too. So first question. Come on, turquoise. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm the auction, I'm the auctioneer. <laughs> I read body language. You move. There's a thought there. Let's hear it. <laughs> so my question would be this: um, In any of these traditions, is puppetry applied to um, spiritual guidance in its application to politics in any of these mm -hmm. societies? My thought being, in our own society. I would like to see political debates done by hand puppets representing mm -hmm. each, you know. But I'm just curious, is there an application to uh, politics? Yeah, well, I'm going to say that, you know, in some of these traditions, those, those um, spheres of what is, you know, that re uh, religious and r ritual isn't necessarily disconnected from other spheres, you know. It's not like its own thing, so it's, things are more involved with their community. Um, yeah, I think uh, specifically in Wayang Kulit, um, oftentimes, um, the, the, the Dalong, which is the, if the, that's the name of the puppeteer, um, who's also considered a priest, um, will get hired by the local health commission to, you know, can, you know, try to build, you know, weave in a get your COVID vax into the performance, right? So that does, that's, I think specifically that's, yeah. that immediately comes to and mind. And Matthew Cohen's article yeah. here is actually very much about... Yeah. Um, uh, problem or issues that came up, you know, with because of political issues because, that yeah. have uh, yeah. circumscribed the tradition or made things go in different directions. Yeah, and then of course there's also, you know, you have issues where, uh, you know, especially and and Salma particularly talks about this because she's specifically talking about you know Islam, and of course there's a whole thing in Islam about representation, and sort of how puppeteers have navigated that tricky thing in Sunni Islam, right? Um, and yet have somehow paradoxically managed to do it quite successfully. And Iran has, I, we were just talking, has like the most Unima members of any country in the world. So, you know, interesting how that, how that played out. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Do we have another question? People are thinking. Yes. Hi, please. yes. <laughs> the lady in the beautiful floral shirt. Thank you. Um, I was just, um, uh, so the question has to do with sort of tradition and uh, versus, if you will, contemporary practices. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just wondering, there's a lot of overlap, um, let's see, now I'm going on to question number two, but so where do you see, in what countries, if we can make such a gross generalization, do you see some of these forms um, very much alive, even with a younger population, and and not necessarily serving an older population. Like, where where are you seeing that, or is is my assumption that they're 
potentially dying out incorrect? Well, I think in Indonesia, things are, they're still very popular tradition. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things about the book is that all of these traditions continue. Um, mm -hmm. And like the Hakumawashi performers who I talk about, this is a tradition that was dying out. I'm not saying that it's not m maybe mostly that they're visiting elderly people, you know, but it was something that was dying out. Um, there was one man who was still doing it and it had actually comes from a, tra uh, a they come from, a, the, the original f uh, families who do this come from a background that's very discriminated against in Japan. They're called the Burakumin and they live in these very, um, different villages and it's there's still stigmas attached to them so he had not wanted his children to do it um, and when these folks started studying with him he didn't even want them to take his photo or to you know use his name so they wouldn't give me his name um, but the people who are doing it now are not connected with with that tradition um, but they are now going to a thousand homes he had stopped going like he was when they first took it over they were going to many fewer homes and they took over studied with him took over his route and so they've actually been expanding it it's still maybe mostly elderly people but it's become a more thriving thing and it also of course has these connections so now it's like this is in tokushima so now it's like tokushima culture you know so there's a different take on it and of course the performers are not associated with that um you know, uh, discriminated community, so it's shifting, but they're really trying to get it, m to, to make it much more um, accepted and bringing it back even to the villages where people originally did it and they give workshops and everything, so they're transforming it. Yeah, yeah and I, just to add on to that, um, what immediately came to mind, now I don't really, I, we actually didn't really look at demographics, so I can't give you sociological data about like, you know, how big the audiences are, or what the, the demographic, you know, makeup of these audiences are. We just weren't really that interested in that particular question. But what I can say is that at least three forms off the top of my head, Hulaki'i, Sogobo, and Topal Kutu, that, that then there is a next generation that has stepped up who are very committed, not, they're committed to keeping this going forward. So Yaya Kulabali's son, uh, 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 Mr. Polivar's son, Raul, who's now at the university, who's at UConn, uh, Ali Mitchell is training another generation to, to bring Hulaki'i forward. Um, and then Isabella Batrado in, in Mamalengo talks about how Mamalengo would, uh, in that form, they often used a lot of traditional Catholic uh, the, um, the, what's it called? The, um, whatever the, I remember. Liturgy? Yeah, no, no, it's, there's a term for it. I'm forgetting what it is, but, it, um, so there's like stories of the saints and that's, people kind of aren't Casual so in, interested in that anymore, but they're really still interested in like the Yoruban stuff, like Shango and the old African gods. So that's still, and there's a very much a rate, much a sort of a identification with people's African roots coming forward by supporting those particular stories in, Mama, in Mamalinga. And the hula ki'i was, uh, uh, was gone. Was gone. You know, this is something that yeah. Ali is like, he's doing a lot of, had done a lot of research on and is actually reviving. So I think what you bring up is interesting is on the one hand, your question is sort of about the audiences, but it also has to do with the practitioners. Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Hey, do we have another question from the floor? Yes, please. Yeah. Wait, 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 Blair. We need He's the microphone. <laughs> the roving. We're, roving. we're live, we're, we're live streaming, darling. <laughs> Could you say something about how you define what a puppet is? I'm, I'm a newcomer to this, so mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering, is any object, uh, I, how do you think about what a puppet is, is the first question. And second, you referred earlier to three different kinds of consciousness, uh, and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about how, what constitutes those three different kinds? Can I take puppet and you can take consciousness? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm divide up. Sure. Um, uh, I would say that I have a very broad view of puppet. And in fact, um, what's cur again, I think of it as a kind of uh, realm of investigation. Because the last two things in the book are probably things that wouldn't in any way reflect on something you think of as a puppet. One is the kava, this uh, box I talked bit about yesterday. It's a kind of uh, box that uh, in Rajasthan, people, um, these particular practitioners go out to the uh, deserts of Rajasthan. And it's kind of like a, 
a traveling altar, they sort of describe it as, and it has all these stories painted on it, and it opens up in all these different ways. So it's a, for me, it's a performing object because of its uh, you know, kinetic uh, movement, yeah, the et cetera. Yeah, the on, on the screen. Oh. Yeah. And the very last one is about the Torah, as we said. And it's interesting because I told you, I, mean, I wasn't brought up religious, but it's like, we can't call the Torah a puppet. You know, like, <laughs> was it pub, Torah's not a puppet. You know, like, so, like, but it's a, a wonderful, um, but I, I, you know, it's like, w let's investigate this, you know, how, where is it in the Jewish religion and what is that material uh, culture? And the um, ar article uh, that wonderful Joe Maybloom, who was one of our master students at Hunter, uh, did is um, very much a kind of performance studies analysis of how the Torah is used, the way it's addressed often as a subject, because that's the way that um, I think in Judaism they feel that you understand social relationships with other people, and so how can you understand a spiritual relationship with God? Well, maybe in that metaphor. And so they, the Torah is danced around the synagogue, people kiss it, There's it when it's, it's dedicated to the um, to the synagogue, there's a kind of, it's uh, like a huppa. yeah, under huppa, it's a yeah. kind of wedding ceremony. Yeah. It gets buried, you know. So there are all of these things that that have this echo, you know. So it's in here as a way for us to reflect and think about puppet as an idea as much as anything else, and a way of, you know, there are, there are traditions where they they're like Ebisu, those are puppets. I mean, I don't think we have too much question. It's got a, you know, f it's a very um, figurative character. It's got joints that move, it's manipulated. And then there are things that I, we th at least for me, I thought were interesting in that realm of questioning that maybe wouldn't be so identified as puppet, but the echoes and the relationships are interesting. And even the one other thing that we saw on the um, Michelle Owings article yeah. on the Christ figure, those were certainly not intended as being called puppets, right. but they're jointed, jointed figures of Christ that were used in passion perform play performances. Yeah, you know? talking about materiality, we, uh, there, there's, a, there's an opening in the side of the figure that we're pretty sure was probably filled with a, with a uh, animal skin with blood and water in it. So at the moment when the, sol when the soldier pierces Christ's side, they literally would pierce and blood and water would come out of the, the figure. So talk about materiality. Now, in terms of consciousness, I mean, what, you know, and again, you know, th this is not an empirical, I can't give you empirical data on this, right? You know, this is all very theoretical. Um, but we're, we're thinking about um, the, the puppeteer, the object, and then God or spirit or the gods or whatever, whatever non-discarnate entity you may be wanting to connect with. You know, whether it's your ancestors, whether it's your higher self, whether it's, you know, Shiva or Buddha or Vishnu or Jesus or whatever, right? That, that somehow that the, the object is somehow, again, I'm really liking this idea of a portal, is somehow that these three things, me and the object and whatever's up there, are all coming together somehow in this focus of this object. And I, I, I'm afraid I, I can't really give you more of a response to that, but does that... Is that help clarify things? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if if again, if you if you go into quantum theory and really kind of go all the way into that idea, and if all if 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 everything is energy, and 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 if, and we use, we're bringing Hegel, right? And we bring in Mr. Mr. Big German philosopher himself, right? And, and so, yeah, and then, and that and Einstein also. Einstein talks about how everything's energy, and and it's just it's just these objects have just slowed their energy down, and we've all slowed our energy down to the point where we can you know, touch each other and sit on things and pick up things, right? But it's all the same thing, fundamentally on the quantum level. It's all the same. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I mean, but, but I think that once you've incarnated, again, I'm gonna go new age woo on you, but like I think once you've incarnated, now Tim Cusick has a different consciousness than Claudia Orenstein, and that's the beauty of it. These two consciousnesses can then begin to understand each other better. And if the book has a different consciousness than me, I can, I can understand the book in a way that if we're all just electrons floating around in space, none of us, our consciousness can't expand. That's the best I got. <laughs> that's the puff, puff, pass moment. <laughs> okay. but, but also, um, we're at the last minute, and oh. I did want to uh, give a shout out to uh, one of our sponsors for 
this whole symposium panel, which is UNIMA USA. Yeah. And since Claudia is on the board of UNIMA USA, if you could just say a few words about how conversations like these uh, represent and further UNIMA's mission. Yeah, I don't have the exact words, but UNIMA's mission is something like um, creating uh, international understanding through puppetry, something like that, and connections. And, um, uh, you know, a book like this, as I was saying before, like it, it, it's about um, creating uh, conversations across cultures and across religions, and certainly we're at a moment historically where these are kinds of conversations we really need to have, mm -hmm. um, and we need to, you know, understand each other and find you know, a different kind of discourse. I mean, you asked this question about politics and this certainly, you know, religion has become so politicized and can we remember and go back to or find a, other models of conversation or ways of communicating and talking about uh, religion? And um, uh, so it, that wasn't, you know, exactly where we started with this book, but certainly by doing that through puppetry, uh, I think is a really wonderful way f to take us in a, you know, help us come to, come to these conversations in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and to see that there are all these traditions across the world and, you know, maybe uh, the Torah is not a puppet, okay? The Torah is not a puppet. Uh, but um, but how it does is it a have performing a, object. Yeah, and how, does yeah. It ha how is there an interesting conversation that can be uh, had and people listen to each other and get to understand each other better? So I hope, mm -hmm. I, I think that's it within the mission of Unima. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you all so much. Thank You're you. a wonderful <laughs> audience. Thank you. Thank you.